Welcome to Mike and Mike Theology Plus, the podcast where we talk about all things related to Christian theology. Hello and welcome to Mike and Mike Theology Plus, where theology matters. I'm Mike, and I'm Mike. Yes, that's right. Yet again, we're doing solo episodes. I'm continuing with my theme of church history, and this time I'm going to be covering Council of Nicaea. So, I want to start with a little bit of a thought experiment. If you're listening in your car or something, you don't have to raise your hand. This is um, a Sunday school lesson that I gave recently, so I'm kind of adapting it from that. But um, think with me, if you will, whether or not you agree that Hitler was evil. I'm an American, so... You know, our country was directly involved in World War II, and we got into that um, eventually with the idea that we were going to be stopping Hitler. So the question is, was it a positive moral action to stop Hitler? Okay. Now, if you know your history, think through with me whether or not there were any negative repercussions that came about as a result of World War II. I can think of a few. I can think of the acceleration of secularism in Europe. Uh, I can think of, in our own nation, pushing a lot of women out of the homes and into full-time employment, which I believe um, has a positive economic impact, but a negative social impact. And ultimately, uh, because we ended up getting involved in the Pacific Theater, The way we ended the war over there was we dropped the bombs, the the atomic bombs, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I cannot necessarily say that that was a wrong decision. Uh, When it comes to war, there's some nasty stuff that sometimes has to be done in order to prevent worse stuff. But I don't think anybody would look at dropping the A-bombs. I think we ended up killing... maybe 800,000 people, which is absolutely horrific and tremendous. Um, And I'm not willing to say that was exclusively a positive moral action. Certainly, a lot of innocents died in that. And theoretically, in war, you know, you're trying to not kill the civilians. You're just having the armies fight. Or take the Vietnam War. I hope most of my listeners would agree that communism is actually an evil governmental system. Um, I think that our country actually had good intentions when we began getting involved in Vietnam. Now, hear what I said. I'm not saying Vietnam was some unmitigated success or anything. All I'm saying is, at the beginning, when we were looking at Vietnam and the desire to stop communism there, I think that was positive. What happened from there is, you know, we can debate that separately. Um... But I think we would all agree that Vietnam did not actually work out well pretty much for anybody that was involved. I mean, who, who won there? Who, who succeeded? Who was benefited and who flourished as a result of that? Uh, or, for instance, uh, take Martin Luther. You know, we're, we're getting kind of away from modern military history and headed back more into church history. But take Martin Luther. Do you think he was a positive influence on the church? Okay. Are you thankful that he facilitated a break from Rome and helped the Protestant church actually reclaim the gospel? I am. But I also have to admit that as a credo Baptist or as one who believes in believer's baptism, um, Martin Luther wouldn't have spent a whole lot of time saving me from execution. In fact, there's a story of Fritz Erba who in the very castle where Luther translated the New Testament into German, just a few years later, this guy who read Luther's German Bible and became convicted of believer's baptism, he was thrown into a dungeon to rot and to die because he would not comply with the state and baptize his children. So, um, you know, there we have something that I think most of us would say was very positive overall in the development of church history, and yet it doesn't escape 
the fact that it has its own warts and problems as well. So what I'm saying here is World War II was complicated. The Vietnam War was complicated. Even Martin Luther was complicated. I think Martin Luther's easily the uh, most positive from a church history perspective of those three. And yet even he was complicated. Um, nobody looks at him and says that he was perfect. So he was very helpful and beneficial to the church, but at the same time, like I said, he had some he had his own warts. Okay. My point in bringing those up is that we need to keep that in mind as we look back at the developments of, say, the Council of Nicaea in the mostly Roman Empire church during the 4th century. There were definitely some positive things that happened, and there were some negative things that were happening simultaneously, and they don't always necessarily cross over one to the other. So we can't, on the one hand, be a Eusebius of Caesarea who seems overwhelming in his praise for Constantine. We can't do that and ignore that there were some problems. But at the same time, just because Constantine was a politician, we shouldn't ignore the fact that some actual good positive developments for the church occurred uh, during his reign and sometimes even, even because of him. So we'll get into that a little bit later on. So let's begin with this. What is the Nicene Creed? The Nicene Creed states this, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things came into being, things in heaven and things on earth, who because of us men, and because of our salvation, came down, and became incarnate, and became man, and suffered, and rose again on the third day, and ascended to the heavens, and will come to judge the living and dead, and in the Holy Spirit. But as for those who say there was when he was not, and before being born he was not, and that he came into existence out of nothing, or who assert that the Son of God is of a different hypostasis, or substance, or created, or is subject to alteration or change, these the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes. Now, if you're paying attention, the part about God the Father is real brief, the part about the Holy Spirit is even briefer, and there's a huge section in the middle that's talking about Jesus Christ. And there's a reason for that. So, why am I doing this? Why do I care about this? Why does this matter? Why should you care about this? Well, because church history shows us God's movements as he has gone about building his church. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ has been at work for the last 2,000 years, keeping that promise and building his church. I don't care about this because I have some misguided notion that the heroes of the faith were perfect or infallible. Constantine, Athanasius, Augustine, Luther, Calvin, all of them were fallible men. But Christ has still always been at work fulfilling his promise to build his church. I don't care about this because I feel like we have to imitate the men or the churches from ancient days exactly. I don't have any need to try to prove that the early church did or said or believed exactly the same way that I do. Revelation was certainly completed at the conclusion of the inspiration of the canon. My personal belief is that that occurred before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. I think Revelation, being the final book, probably was written in the mid to late 60s. If you want to say that Revelation was 95, great. Uh, you and I can totally agree on that. If you want to say that it was like 175, we got some problems. But my point is, I believe Revelation was completed in the first century. The close of the New Testament canon and the Revelation was completed. Nevertheless, I would argue that understanding of the doctrine that's contained in the canon and the development of that understanding has continued over time. 
Even today, there are issues that are arising that need good men who think biblically to address them. So, while scriptural revelation has been completed since the first century, doctrinal development can and should continue as we seek to understand the scriptures better and better. We don't merely look back and say, okay, give me just the scriptures and I don't care about what happened between then and now. And we don't just say, we're going to go interpret everything on our own and learn it all new today. No, we look back, we see that the scriptures are the one single soul rule of faith and practice for the church. And yet we also realize that God has been building his church, and for 2,000 years there have been godly men who have been working through issues. I think I mentioned the last time I did a solo episode about Ignatius and the issues of martyrdom that came up. You know, the, the church today is dealing with a lot of issues of martyrdom around the globe. I'm afraid that the church in America is actually going to have to deal with those issues personally in the coming decades. Well, guess what? There's a lot of source material from the early church where men who experienced it, went through it, thought deeply about it, discussed it, and came up with some wisdom that would be very beneficial for us today. Now, it's not the same context, and so it doesn't necessarily apply one-to-one, and they didn't necessarily get it perfectly right. So, they aren't scripture, but they're still extremely valuable, and going back and referencing them is something that is very wise to do, because it's a good resource. So, Why do I care about Nicaea in particular? Why should you care about it? What's the point? Well, I would argue it's an important development of orthodoxy in, by, and for the universal church. The definition, the creedal statement of the Trinity, I would argue is a watershed issue in the history of the church. Was it believed before Nicaea? Absolutely, yes. Um, you can go back, I did this last time, you go back into Ignatius and you can see him very clearly calling Christ God. And there are even a couple of passages that appear to be Trinitarian. So I don't think that this is something that Ignatius was not acquainted with. At the same time, it wasn't really until some later controversies came up, particularly Arianism, that the church came together studied this issue, thought through it well, and came out with a crystallized statement that succinctly summarizes biblical truth in this area. And I think that that was absolutely massively important, what happened at Nicaea. I don't think that Nicaea is a watershed issue or something that's important that we all know, because I somehow believe that councils are binding on the universal church or on the consciences of unbelievers, right? The, the Roman church, and I believe to some extent the Eastern church, Eastern Orthodox and Greek Orthodox and all, they would look at at least a couple of the early councils and say they are absolutely binding. I know the Roman Catholic church says it's because that the Pope says that they are. Okay, That's not why I think Nicaea is important. Nicaea stands on its own merits because what it did was important. The issue that it addressed is vital for Christianity. I would say that it's a mark of orthodoxy versus heresy. That if you hold to anti-Trinitarianism after having knowledge of biblical Trinitarianism, that you're a heretic, and that that means you don't possess salvation. So it's an incredibly important issue to grasp and understand and get right. Quick side note on orthodoxy, heterodoxy, and heresy. Uh, Heresy is not merely getting stuff wrong. Heresy is on a primary biblical doctrine, one that approaches salvation, that touches at the core of the gospel, like, for instance, the nature of God, who he is, the nature of Christ, who he was. When you know the truth and you willingly reject it, that is heresy. Heresy means you're an unbeliever. Heresy means that you have been given access to the truth and good teaching of the truth, and you are knowingly rejecting that truth from Scripture. Heresy is not, well, I'm just not sure. Or, you know, that one time when I tried to defend the Trinity, I actually made a modalistic analogy. That's not heresy. So, you, I, 
I've, I would argue very strongly, you cannot be an accidental heretic. Um, if you are seeking to be submissive to your church and your elders that are preaching the true gospel and you want to love God and serve him, um, you, you don't need to be worried that you're going to be an accidental heretic. Heresy is something that is knowingly embraced as you walk away from the truth of Scripture. Okay, moving on a little bit deeper. Why do I think that creeds and confessions are valuable? Well, at a very basic level, I think it's because they are at least attempts at summaries of biblical truth. And that's good. And we need that. And we know that we need that because we're in churches where hopefully our pastor gives us one of those every week. What do I mean? Well, what is a sermon if not a summary of biblical truth, or at least an explanation of it, at least taking a passage of scripture? I'm hoping that you're part of a a church where the preaching is expository, and the pastor goes through a passage and reads it out, and then connects it to other pieces of scripture, explains what's going on, gives you the context, explains the background material, you know, if Paul was in Ephesus or if he was in Philippi or whatever, here's how this plays in, and there's an explanation, there is a contextualization, there is categorization that goes on, and the truths of scripture are supplemented and augmented so that we can understand them better. I don't mean we're adding to scripture. What I mean is, We don't go on Sunday and just hear somebody stand up and read the Bible. Parenthetically, I wish we would do more of that. It appears that the early church put a high value on reading extended portions of the Scripture, and I think we should do that. But at the same time, we all expect that someone's going to get up and explain it to us. Think about the Ethiopian eunuch. He's reading from Isaiah. Um, I don't. I think it was Philip who said, do you know what you're talking about or what you're reading about? And he says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? Well, in my view, councils and creeds and confessions are attempts to take the biblical data and accurately summarize them in a way that systematizes them, crystallizes them, summarizes them, and makes them perhaps a little more immediately accessible than those same truths are as they are scattered throughout the revelation of scripture. Another reason that I think they're valuable is that when they are published, creeds and confessions provide an external standard that can be evaluated and discussed. Um, I agree with Carl Truman, who says that everyone has their own creed that they live by. All Christians live by a creed. Even the ones that say, you know, the Bible only, only the Bible is my creed or whatever, they all, every one of us have a creed. Because a creed is simply a summary of what we believe is true about God and the gospel. Well, if every one of us does, but not every one's is published, then how do we examine our own creeds? It becomes a lot more difficult. However, when we externalize them, when we actually write them down, then they're open to scrutiny. Not only from other people, but from ourselves. Because there's stuff that when I'm writing out an opinion to post in, say, a Theology Matters discussion... I'll write something the first time and reread it and go, you know, that's not exactly what I mean. And by by putting it external to myself, it gives me the ability to chew over it and to refine it and to think it through. And external creeds and confessions are are excellent about doing that and giving a standard because I can say I believe all of the Bible and an Arminian can say the same thing, but it's very helpful to know that that person and I do not understand the same parts in the same ways. And so by having that external standard, it helps bring clarity. It helps bring education. It makes things a little more accessible. It makes things easier to grasp, and it makes it so that they can be examined, studied, discussed, refuted. And in the case of the Council of Nicaea, we've got one that has stood the test of time. It is In its original form, it's almost 1,700 years old, and its expanded form from Constantinople, it's about 1,650 years old. And pretty much no Orthodox church has a problem with what they said. Now, there might be nuances, and you might want to do this versus that, but basically everyone that's in the Christian church agrees that they got it right oh so long ago. So what's its value? It got it right. They got scripture right, and we can go back and refer to it 
and we can use it as a guide as we as we struggle with some of the more difficult parts of Scripture. And what does it mean for God to have been incarnated? What does it mean for there to be three persons that share one essence or nature or being? Those are difficult concepts, and so this can be a guide and a help as we're trying to really grapple with the Scriptures. Um, but to be very clear, I don't believe that creeds and confessions are inspired, and I don't believe that they have any intrinsic authority. Okay? I believe there was one church council in all of history, the Jerusalem Council in about 50 AD, that had actual intrinsic authority. They were binding the consciences of the church because they were the apostles and they had the authority to do that. Uh, Everything that's occurred since then, uh, from councils to creeds to confession, all of those are valuable and useful only in as much as they accurately reflect scriptural teachings. Though they can be very beneficial, they are optional and not binding on the conscience of any believer. Um, and, you know, if you go to some of the creeds that I think are positive, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and London Baptist Confession of Faith, though I will say, uh, I value the Westminster Confession highly, but obviously, as a Baptist, I'm going to take exception with its sections on baptism. Um, I think more recently, the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy, the Nashville Statement, the recent, I think it was this year, the Statement on Social Justice and the Gospel. I think these are good statements that are accurately reflecting the truths of Scripture, and in particular with the more recent statements, they are speaking to cultural issues that are relevant to our times. I don't believe that the issue of inerrancy is a minor issue. I don't believe that the issue of sexuality as given by God is a minor issue. I don't believe that the attempt to bring in Marxist ideals and foist social justice onto the church is a minor thing. And so I think that those statements are good because they take us back to say this is what the scriptures say, and they summarize them in ways that are helpful, and I believe that are truthful. But, um, you know, not all of them have been very good. The five articles of the Remonstrance were I don't know if you would call it a creed or a statement or whatever that was put out. I don't agree with that one. Um, there was one from the Second Council of Nicaea. First Council of Nicaea, real good. Second Council of Nicaea, or real bad. They basically said it's cool to <clears throat> venerate images. Well, I would argue that venerate and worship are basically two sides of the same coin. So my point is not to whitewash all councils throughout history, there were a lot of councils that followed Nicaea in the 4th century that actually upheld Arianism. So a council, I mean, councils have disagreed with one another all over the place. Obviously, councils in and of themselves aren't valuable. What makes them valuable or not is what they put out and how well it reflects biblical truth. So why do I value the Nicene Creed? Because it accurately summarizes biblical teaching about God the Father against Gnosticism, Jesus Christ as very God against Arianism, and the Trinity against modalism. Okay. We don't have a whole lot of time to do this, so I'm going to give a little bit of historical background leading up to Nicaea and then do another episode on what happened there and the aftermath. Basically, in the three tens, you had this guy named Arius who was a presbyter in Alexandria in Egypt, and he starts preaching that Jesus Christ was a created being. He comes up with this famous slogan, there was when he was not, which indicates that there was a time when Jesus did not exist. Time is probably not the best word because Arius would have said that Christ was created kind of before the world's type of deal. But there, there was, we, we don't really have words in our language since we're so time-based, but th there was a point at which time, there I go again, Jesus came into existence. So it's, it's denying the eternality of Christ. And although he would say that Jesus Christ is hyper-exalted, that he is absolutely preeminent among all of the created beings, as one of my favorite guys, James White, says, 
you have on the north rim of the Grand Canyon, you have the uncreated God on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, you have everything else. It doesn't matter how highly exalted the everything else is, there's a huge chasm between uncreated eternal God and created. And so Arius's bishop, Alexander of Alexandria, one of the easier names in church history to remember, so Alexander gets a hold of this and starts preaching about the eternal generation of the Son, which is the language that has basically become orthodoxy. At this point, Alexander decides to not shut up. He starts making some waves. So, I'm sorry, at this point, Arius decides to keep teaching what he's teaching. So Alexander calls a local synod in, I believe it was 321, where they condemn him. That did not stop Arius. And if I'm not mistaken, he goes off kind of into the Middle East and writes a book. And so basically he is not giving up. He is going to continue teaching what he's going to teach. And so there's problems. There, there's fracture beginning to occur in the church. Now, here's where some good history comes into play. A lot of people will say that Constantine called the Council of, Con of Nicaea in 325, because he was afraid that he didn't have a good enough hold on the empire. Uh, he hadn't been in charge of East and West for all that long. And so he comes in because he wants to unify the church as a way to unify his empire. I disagree with that. And the reason that I disagree with that is as follows. The reasons, I guess, are as follows. Um, for one thing, as far as I know, the high, high, high estimates of the demographics of the church would say that maybe at the absolute best, something like 18% of the church was Christian when Constantine came to power. Okay? In addition to that, so that's, you know, 82% being not Christian. That's an overwhelming majority there. Um, in addition to that, the church was overwhelmingly made up of people from the lower strata of society. So you have a whole lot of poor people. So you don't have all that many people compared to the overall population of the empire, and the ones that you do have are kind of the poor and powerless ones. Well, guess what? The Roman Empire was a military dictatorship. The emperor did not have to get reelected. He was in for life. And basically what he needed to do was keep two sets of people happy. One was the aristocracy, because they were the ones that paid the taxes. And two was the military, because if you ticked the military off enough, well, you're dictator or emperor for as long as you live, but the army can control how long that might be. Okay. Meanwhile, the army is massively pagan massively pagan. In fact, the legions had their standards with superstitious religious elements on them, some of them which went back like five and six hundred years. And they were very pagan. They, they believed in the gods. And so the idea that by unifying the church, Constantine was kind of building the solid foundation for his empire, I'm just not very convinced by it. Um, most of the aristocracy was pagan, and so the people who are going to pay you the taxes don't care about the Christians or really, I mean, the, the elites in Roman society for hundreds of years had been mocking Christianity because it was a religion of poor people. And then Constantine comes in, and he's telling the army, you know, to throw away their religious standards and draw the cross on their breastplates or shields and stuff like that. So the point is, Constantine is not reading the book How to Win Friends and Influence People when he's going in to try and help the church. That, in my opinion, is just not at all a savvy political movement in order to try to rally his base or something like that. Remember, the poor people weren't the base for the empire. I mean, they were the base for the empire. They weren't the base for governmental power, though. So, um, I don't believe that Constantine was just swooping in in order to do this for purely political reasons. Now, I also don't think that he was doing it for no political reasons at all, but nonetheless, I think that sometimes we tend to either assume that Constantine was this saint that was pure as the driven snow, or he was this devilish politician and all he cared about was uh, 
consolidating his power. I believe the truth is somewhere much more in the middle than that. But what he does do is he calls a council. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was going to be held at Constantinople, and then it got moved to Nicaea. And he invites all 1,800 bishops from around the empire. And according to tradition, 318 showed up. He paid their way to come. He paid to put them up for about six weeks, and he paid their way home. And this also did not make a lot of the aristocracy happy. You know, why is he wasting tax money on putting up the clergy? That didn't make sense to them. But anyway, they're taking up this cause. They're taking up the idea or discussion of Arianism versus Alexandrianism, um, eventually what becomes Trinitarian Orthodoxy. And for about six weeks during the summer of 325, they debate the issue. Very quickly, it comes out that there are three parties. The Arian party, um, saying that Christ was a created being, they wanted to use a Greek word, um, heterousios, which means of a different substance or of a different nature. Well, that was basically thrown out almost from the start. There was very little support for that. But there were two other groups. There were the groups that said hamousios, of the same substance, essence, or nature, and then hamoiousios, of a similar substance, essence, or nature. And so those groups really had to hash it out. And you might think that the hamoiousios group was somehow compromised or compromising, but they actually came into this. Most of them were from the Eastern Church, and they had dealt with modalism and Sabellianism in previous days. And for them, hearing that Jesus, the Son, was the same substance as the Father, sounded to them a whole lot like modalism. And in modalism, you just have one person. You have one God, one nature, one person, and he just kind of wears different masks at different times to reveal himself in different modes throughout history. And so when they heard the Hamousius, the same substance with the Father, they initially kind of balked against that and really had a problem with it. Well, eventually the argument that was successful said, no, that's not what we're saying, uh, and really there's only the one way to see, and that is that Jesus and the Father are they share one divine essence or nature or being. And so that was what was decided. Um, a vote was taken. We don't know how many people actually voted. Um, it does seem like we know with fair confidence that there were only two votes against Nicene Orthodoxy. And depending on how many um, bishops you think were actually there, there were some two or three hundred in favor of it. So Dan Brown wants you to think that it was some kind of a close call when Jesus became God, to coin uh, or to borrow a Bart Ehrman phrase, but it was an overwhelming landslide vote in favor of Nicene Orthodoxy. That's a bit ironic, and the reason for that we will discuss next time. So there's just a little bit of some background on creeds and councils in general, uh, and then some specific background on what led up to the Council of Nicaea in 325. That was absolutely about a million foot flyover. There is so, so, so much more detail to go into, uh, going back to the Alexandrian school and origin and all kinds of other fine details that play into why this person did that and why that person did this. But there are some broad brushes. Hopefully it would wet your appetite and you will go and learn on your own. All right, again, I don't have my primer with me, but I'm going to try this. Let's see. Think well, love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly. Bye. You've been listening to Mike and Mike Theology Plus, the podcast where we talk about all things related to Christian theology.